Here. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Alan Young, who is not only chair of the CMIO committee, practicing physician, um, he's everywhere. I actually think there's probably eight or 10 of Alan because he is everywhere in our landscape these days. He's gonna bring up the panelists. It's a great group of individuals and get that technology panel started. So a warm round of applause, please. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here on a Friday. Um, we hope to make this next panel as engaging and inspiring as you've heard this morning. I think it's really going to be a good culmination based on Dr. Bob Nani's comments this morning, as well as hearing from a great nursing panel, as well as thinking about patient experience from outside of healthcare. I think this panel discussion will drive us a little further into what's happening in the industry and what the future holds for us. So I'm going to call up and maybe have all four of our speakers start coming up, uh, Joe, John, Jeff, and Christian. <clears throat> uh, they represent uh, four very well established and you know powerful companies in the tech industry but I'm asking them to take off their kind of individual company hats and talk about what they see in the industry and what technology will bring with this idea of focusing around how patient experience is really critical to their success as well as the success of uh, organizations that are deploying technology. Great thank you and I'll try to represent uh, maybe the clinician or provider perspective just by background in addition to serving on the SoCal HIMSS board as the CMIO committee chair. I'm the current chief medical officer for a startup called Giant that's using AI NLP through chatbots to really engage patients with their health systems. I also lead an organization called uh, the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs in Los Angeles, so really trying to provide a network for some of those young talented physicians you saw in the audience today receiving awards to really give them a community to connect. I think when I was practicing medicine and learning medicine, there wasn't these type of outlets for us to really get support and learn about technology, learn about entrepreneurship. Uh, so I'm, I'm helping with that organization. And we also have an organization in Los Angeles called Scale LA, which is a co-working space that's really designed to help these startups uh, innovate and uh, scale and accelerate uh, the, through their journey in this challenging industry, which these gentlemen will attest to about how hard it is to get things sometimes through a healthcare organization when it seems like a good solution, a good fit, Technology is proven, it's been done in other industries. Why, is it, why are we having these challenges? So I'll let each of you kind of share maybe something you guys have worked on recently in your current role or past role about uh, how you're tackling this problem with patient experience and what angle you, your company or yourself have, have on that uh, perspective. I'll go first. Um, I would say that the challenge that our company has in terms of getting started, and this is going to frame sort of um, our perspective on things is we see the joinder between security and privacy and the explosion of consumer engagement and consumerization and experience. So when we talk about patient experience, I'm extending that out to be the consumerization of healthcare, right? Try to create more of a retail experience or an experience that you're used to having in banking or travel or finance or whatnot. And so we go out to the market and we talk about the notion that you really need to harmonize that ecosystem. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But what we're finding is the market maybe isn't quite there yet and that the providers are trying to figure out where do I even begin on this patient experience, this patient engagement journey. And so what we've done to Alan's question is we've started to focus on what we believe are a couple of very critical and um, high value but yet affordable I'll call them point solutions or point offerings that allow providers to get started. Uh, one of them is, is, is wayfinding, and, and that's the one I'll sort of highlight. Um, indoor hospital navigation. Your hospitals are a mess, people. They are not in good shape. They're bolted on over years, and they're hard to get around, and it's a huge anxiety factor for the folks that are trying to get around them. And uh, so in the interest of bringing that anxiety down, uh, there are some solutions on the market for, for, for doing indoor navigation. Our take is a little bit different, though. We partnered with a, um, we went outside um, the U.S. and partnered with a, uh, a Dutch firm who has, we believe, a better mousetrap in that they use uh, photo landmark navigation rather than the beacons and the blue dots. And so rather than trying to understand where you are on a plan view of a map, a top-down view of a map, and you see a little dot that represents you and you start to move and it doesn't move and then you turn around and instead what you see in front of you is a picture of the landmark in front of you with a directional arrow and text that says stay straight and then you just keep swiping it and it takes you from picture to picture to picture. I think it's, um, uh, it's, it's one of the most successful things that we've seen that's being done which is why we decided to partner with this firm and so I start with that. Thanks Jeff. 
So I'll go next. So we're doing a lot of work at Microsoft around the whole bot side of the business you were chatting about. Um, in fact, we produced a, a chat bot model for healthcare specific ingested protocols in it. And we're doing a lot of clinical triage, if you would, to guide people to the right places in the health system. And so we released that from a general availability perspective in February. And there's already been over 1,200 bots built by various different organizations. So it, you would never see this tech. You wouldn't see Microsoft's name on this technology. What you would see is the bot that's operating as the health system to help guide people through their process. One of the interesting examples is we put it into Cincinnati Children's in a wayfinding kind of vehicle as well to help the parents of these children navigate around the facility, know when their next appointment is, and the bot actually talks to them and guides them through their process as they're there. And what we've seen is that the response to that has been during those visits is the HCAP scores for those players have gone straight up as we've seen them engage in that way. Because as we talked about earlier, anxiety's been coming down. So that's just one example of many things we've been working on. But, uh, and uh, I'll add a, a different example. One of the things that we've done with uh, our Foundry Innovation Centers that deals specifically with the patient experience is dealing with connectivity. And there are a lot of things going on with remote patient connectivity or, or connecting remote clinicians as well. But a good example is um, something that we built in one of our innovation foundries to connect a prosthesis so that someone who has a below the knee amputation can take a, a prosthetic leg and now it has an LTE connected sensor on it. So we can tell now through the maker of the prosthesis whether that patient is actually using it and using it properly. And one thing that, that we all know is that it, if those kinds of things aren't used within the right amount of time, then the patient will either be readmitted or maybe even come in later with problems with their other limb. Um, so there is a little bit of patient feedback and, and training as to how things are going as well as an overall better experience for the patient just by connecting something like that to our uh, LTE network. Thank you. Um, and, and so that touches on a great point because I think a lot of technology is very patient-centric, meaning this is what patients or consumers want in healthcare. They see it in other industries. We talked this morning about all the different things that we see from, from a convenience perspective, the use of voice through Alexa at home. And, and so patients, I think, are willing to use technology in the healthcare space. But one of the barriers I've found is that getting the other large group of stakeholders, providers and health system executives to buy into this and say, this is the right thing to do is the right time, and it makes sense from both an executive or financial perspective. And I, I think all of you have probably had experiences getting your technology to the point where it's actually touching the lives of physicians and patients. But what are those challenges that you've come across kind of behind closed doors? What are kind of the, the barriers that you've overcome to have to get to this point where your companies can actually deploy the creation of 1,200 chatbots or having the ability to interact with multiple different EMR systems? I don't know if you guys can talk a little bit about that because I think a lot of Smaller companies, including my own and some that I've worked with, think that healthcare, they can go in and they have the right idea. But to, to Dr. Bavnani's point, it's 99% about execution and implementation, right? Everyone has great ideas of what's going to solve the problem, but actually getting it done is really what takes that perseverance and that strategic mindset as well as understanding how the healthcare industry works. So I don't know if one of you wants to take a stab at that first. I'll start if that's okay. So there's two things I'll use to answer that question. So first and foremost, what we found is that we need to make sure that when we produce a technology, it streamlines into the workflow of the care provider. So there's a couple ways that we've done that. So one example is that there's a huge analytics capability that sits behind Epic. It's all focused on Microsoft technology. And if you haven't heard of it, it's called the Epic Cognitive Computing Platform. And what it does is it takes signals from all over the health system, guides those signals at machine learning models that sit inside of Azure, basically allows that to determine what the next best step of care is with that care provider, for that care provider, and then pushes that signal right back out through Epic to the care provider. So we're not making the care provider find a different vehicle to see these things. It's living right inside their workflow and it's providing them some intelligence they didn't otherwise have. If you wanted to experience that, you would go to Epic and say, I want to use this. So while we're the backing technology to all that, and we've helped create that, we feel like the integration to that workflow is very important. 
And the second example I'll use, um, if anybody wants to go look it up, go look up Microsoft and this thing called EmpowerMD. It's one of, the one of the things that's being talked about by most of the care providers out in the world. And really what it is, is it's an automated scribe that basically takes the computer physically out of the physical computer device, out of the doctor-patient relationship. So I no longer have a medical professional sitting there doing this, not really being able to engage with the patient, but basically picks up the signals of both voices. And then we talked about voice being big in, in the conversations earlier, picks up the signal from both the voices, dissects it, actually helps that doctor create the notes, and then puts the doctor in control of those notes. So if it's not exactly what they wanted, they'll revamp them. And the beauty of it is it learns over time that doctor's preferences and how they notate and all that kind of stuff. We did that as a research project, and it's becoming much, much closer to production-ready capability. So hopefully in the next 6 to 9, 12 months, you'll see that technology come out. Again, probably not a direct from Microsoft piece of technology. It'll come through one of our partners. I'll go the other direction. That's good stuff, and that's the uh, focus on some technology that's really playing an important role. I'm going to talk culture. I think that you know where the where the rubber meets the road and the and, and the um, and the engagements and the initiatives that I've been involved in to build out patient engagement ecosystems, the collection or curation of apps to support a variety of engagement functions. Um, the, to get to that last mile, to what you're asking, Alan, it's all about the culture. Um, so here's an example, and this is actually true. You're going to get a kick out of this because it, see, it's a Microsoft chat bot. This actually was used in um, uh, Facebook Messenger, built in Microsoft Bot Framework, right? So it's a, so picture you're in uh, you're in you're in Facebook Messenger, and you and you go in, and the, the health system I'm talking about was offering capability to to get in line or hold your place in line for uh, for urgent care. So you get to see the wait times, and there was a little algorithm that would run that would show you the, the the in order the urgent cares of in order of that which is the combination of closest to you as well as has the shortest wait time that's what we have to watch out for because you're only as strong as your weakest link from a process perspective so you got to have buy-in from the organization everybody has to know these initiatives that you're putting forth and what you're doing the tech can be really cool but you if you don't have that backstop you run the risk of angering and upsetting and dissatisfying the patient maybe more so than if you'd even rolled out the technology to begin with and i would just add and one of the things that worked well for me when i was in healthcare it was we had an innovation unit, so it was one specific unit within our, in our health system that we would bring in newer technologies, whether it be you know, clinical coming to us with a specific problem or new technologies like devices or, or Bluetooth beacons, whatever it may be to, to determine whether or not it was functional with our environment. But the, the key piece for that, and it really is, is you need to get clinician buy-in, but you also have to have it running in real time, so proof of concepts. You know, competition has gotten great in, in IT, in, in healthcare IT now. So there may be 10 or 15 vendors that do the exact same thing that you're looking for. But being able to stand them up in real time and look at them and have your clinical teams, your physician teams look at them, find the easiest interface, find the best workflows, that really helps, you know, your adoption models. There's nothing worse for a CIO to spend millions of dollars on a new project and the adoption rate is 20%. We all don't want to do that. I think the challenge for us is really to define those roles and engage with, with, with partners who are willing to go that step with proof of concepts in your environments and have those environments ready to be able to run with that and figure out what works best for you because again there may be 15, 20 choices in, in the ecosystem but there's one that's a perfect fit for you so it really takes time to do the diligence both on the technical side because operationally you still have to support it so hopefully you can get some type of Know, crosswalk between the clinical needs and the operational you know requirements for your teams thank you and the other piece that I've noticed is the rise of new roles within organizations that really are in a position to support or champion initiatives that focus around patient experience or innovation or also be the ones to say no this is not a good fit for our organization historically I think when EMRs electronic health records were starting to roll out, a lot of that fell onto the chief in, chief uh, information officers. And they have historically held the purse strings in tandem with the CFO. But now we see the rise of a chief experience officer, a chief innovation officer, a chief digital officer. You can go alphabet soup. Um, and I just wanted to see, you know, as you guys are engaging these larger clients and smaller clients and health systems, 
Um, what roles have you seen to be very instrumental to help get your product moving forward outside of the traditional channels? Um, yes, all of the above on the alphabet soup yes, yeah. on all of the, um, th there, there is a, a trend to more formalize some of the innovation and, uh, and development work. Um, we've also seen that even though there are, um, some ways to organize that, uh, there's also, uh, there, there also needs to be, um, the feeling that every employee in the organization is also in charge of innovating so that there's not a, a set aside group that that only does the innovation and the rest of the, the people then are, are become users of whatever comes out of that group. So it, it's a bit of a balance I've seen with, with a lot of the large customers that, that we deal with where there's um, an independent focus on experience and innovation and, and development and those kinds of things. But it also has to be evangelized throughout the entire organization at the same time. So it's, it's kind of that duality. I'll add to that list, I'll add chief marketing officer. Um, they don't have budget, sorry, if you're marketing officers. You typically don't have much budget yet. Maybe it's going that way. But boy, are they going to be a key component to this. Because the marketing function in a healthcare context in the past was fairly disjointed and distinctly different from what's going on in operations and technology. There wasn't as much interplay. The campaigns that they're running to drive service lines or to, to just give more brand awareness to the health system was, uh, you know, they were kind of just traditional old school marketing. But now when you're engaging patients in the help of their own wellness and in things that provide more frictionless access to facilities or a better experience, that activity itself is marketing. And they not only need to be aware of it, but they need to be knee deep involved in helping understand how the best way to get that adopted is going to be. And so that's kind of what I'm saying. I'm seeing that's the stakeholder that really needs to be brought in the game in order for these things to be successful. I would say that we're seeing three major roles come out where we're seeing success. So that's usually been, frankly, focused on the chief innovation officer, which is a relatively new role in a lot of these places. Some people call it a chief data officer, but it's all around the analytics piece, right? It's those two roles combined together. We see a lot of success. And then we're starting to see, we are, as you mentioned, there's chief experience officers coming up. I go to this patient experience uh, forum every year, and we've watched it progress over the last four years from managers to directors, and now they're chief experience officers, and we can do very creative stuff with those folks. And then the last one is not a chief at all. One of our best examples of where we're having great success is where we find a doctor or a nurse or someone that's passionate about something through a set of hackathons that we run. And we actually see large organizations being built out of that kind of stuff to help healthcare along. If you want to look one up, there's a company named Iris, which is focused on originally on diabetic retinopathy. Now it's gone lots of different places. But it's basically changing the conformance level in diabetic retinopathy because it's taken the pain of that from the experience of the, of the patient away. They no longer have to go to another appointment. They don't have to get their eyes dilated. They don't have to have someone drive them there. They don't have to pay a copay. They sit down in front of a camera that's optimized from an analytics perspective right at the point of care. It takes a snapshot of their retina, three seconds, five seconds, determines whether that snapshot's good enough to do an analytics model on, pushes it back to the cloud, does analytics, and then it's read by a professional in the back end to give them a report. Changes the whole conformance. The number of people that are actually conforming in that space now has gone way up. So. And that came from a doctor that just had an idea that he wanted to stop blindness from diabetic retinopathy. And I would just like to add, I mean, I think all the points are, are, are great, but the, the best implementations of the best technology adoptions I've seen are combinations of all of those. It really has to be a team effort internally within an organization because everyone thinks about the bits and the bytes and how cloud impacts clinical, but unless it's meshed properly across internally, if it's an internal application deployment or out to your patients, if it's a new technology or a new facility being built, it doesn't work. So really it has to have, you know, all those key pieces as part of, the, of, those, of those teams in order to be, you know, successful in, in, in large scale. Yeah, I agree. Healthcare innovation takes a village. And not only a village, but a village with direction and leadership as well. So however you can get your idea or your project 
get some traction within an organization, either of these roles can be a good starting point, but understanding you need everyone else engaged eventually. So there's no point to ignore the clinical stakeholders or the technical stakeholders. You really have to approach it in a creative way to make sure you find your niche and then go from there. So I'll, you guys mentioned a, a number of different use cases and solutions, and we've heard about different technologies, but besides artificial intelligence, which I think everyone in this room is probably aware has been a hot topic for a while, voice we've heard a few times today. Um, in, in your experience, both as a, a professional and within a corporate environment, what's the next groundbreaking or thought-provoking technology that's going to really transform patient experience? Is there something that you guys have seen or heard or speculating or people making big investments in this area? What have you seen from your different perspectives? I think spatial computing in general, I, you know, understanding about, you know, you know, augmented reality overlays or or real-time scribes we talked about with voice, all of that in general, you know, tied together with, you know, proximity sensors and, and, and GPS, I think all of that spatial computing in general, being able to interact with not only, you know, your physicians in, in facilities, but medication on your shelf or, or in real time, if you have an interaction between this medication and fruit juice, whatever it may be, that spatial computing and augmented reality in real time, I think, will be a, be a, a huge benefit in the future. I'll jump on board with Christian. Um, augmented reality is something that's going to be near and dear to our hearts. I talked about the wayfinding experience before. Today, you're walking, you, you know, if you take advantage of that, it's a very useful tool. You're, you're swiping through photographs of landmarks that are in front of you. In the future, you're wearing a pair of glasses, you're walking through, and you're seeing directionals and little text indicators say stay straight or left in 15 steps. It, that's a wonderful idea of a way to, to in, a, in, a, in a way to reduce somebody's anxiety to help make sure that they get where they're supposed to go in the hospital. Um, the one thing I will say, if it's okay, Alan, I'll jump in on, on, um, on um, uh, blockchain. Blockchain solves a very interesting problem. The technology is very mature now. It's not that actually, I don't think it's that complicated. But the use case of blockchain tends to be interorganizational, and I just think it's important for folks to understand that. That, you know, I think things like augmented reality, spatial computing, those kinds of things can be built by startups and create products that then can be released into the market. I think if you create a blockchain um, uh, capability set to manage a medical record, and you know, or to manage a medication list to make sure you've always got the current. It's a great idea technically, but you need to work with all of the different organizations that are going to touch that, and that's where the challenge is there. The challenge there is that with the technology, I see that actually going out further and not actually coming to reality until a little bit further in the future. So I'll throw in there this term we call cognitive computing. So that's the space where we think we're going to have the biggest uptake of capability because it changes the way you interact with the technology. And so we have a whole cognitive computing suite that comes out in vision services that you've talked about, about using it for various different things with your eyes and stuff. Uh, but it also comes out in language understanding. It comes out in translation services. It's basically a whole suite of services that don't require you to touch a computer anymore. Some of those are even focused in behavioral analytics. Like we've been able to, through search engine cognitive computing services, we've been able to determine early diagnosis of people that might be in a disease category, which is fascinating when you think about it, because if you're carrying certain diseases, you'd want to know very, very early, right? So there's a whole suite of ways you interact with the technology that make it smoother and easier. We call those all cognitive services. And and that's a space that we think is going to get a huge uptake because it's finding its way into all these products. And I want to hear Joe's opinion, but also comment on 5G as well, if you can. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, what is 5G? <laughs> so, so in case you haven't heard, there's this new G coming. Um, so 5G is actually here, and uh, I've actually got um, a little bit of it deployed in a healthcare provider setting. Uh, but, but it's... From a ubiquity point of view, it, it's kind of coming soon. But the thing about 5G that makes it one of those upcoming next great technology things is it's it's really built for the things and not necessarily the humans. Um, we're going to be able to enjoy the high capacity throughput that, that everybody tends to think about first when you think about 5G. It's going to be an order of magnitude 
download speed, depending on how your device connects and, and where you are, those kinds of things. But there's a lot more to it than that from the infrastructure point of view, which is where I live. It also will be able to support uh, a million devices within a square kilometer. That's a lot of stuff. And as we talked about earlier, the 900 million people that are going to be connected, just think about the, the connections that aren't on people that will also be connected. No matter where you are, you don't have to worry about the, the Wi-Fi connectivity at your house or, or whatever. It, it will just be connected no matter where you go. And, and the other aspect that we're deploying when it comes to 5G is the edge compute part of it. Um, where we'll be able to break up the core of our network and move the microservices around to the base of the tower or maybe even the DAS that's in your hospital. And it allows us not just to do the things that we've all done with cloud where we take servers and we move them off site, but we'll actually be able to move the servers and the services where they should be. Instead of just moving them away, you can actually break down whether it's authentication or the different accounting functions or, or whatever, um, the scene rendering for some of the, the virtual reality goggles that the patients may have on for comfort or for pain distraction therapy. A lot of that uh, math can be done at the edge rather than 50 to 100 milliseconds away at the data center. It could be 1 to 10 milliseconds away at that point. And that's a big part of the infrastructure that's being deployed right now with 5G as well. Yeah. So I did want to thank you for getting 5G moving because there's another component of this that's actually really got a distance out there, and we call it quantum computing. And I don't know if you've heard the term yet, but the reason it's exciting is we're already starting to see some results. There is not a stable quantum computer just yet. I mean, there's been some that have been produced. They can't process for long periods of time, but the the quantum algorithms that were the, the algorithms that are inspired by quantum computing are already starting to see an effect. We've been working with Case Western to change the way they actually pulse signal their MRIs to actually shorten the amount of time a patient has to spend in an MRI and actually drastically improve the quality of the image and signature that's coming out of those. So it, that's a that's probably even further out there, but it's we're starting to already see some great success in that space. And so the next comment I have is really around healthcare being regional. Here in the United States, I think we understand how complicated it is. You go from California to Kentucky to New York. Healthcare is delivered regionally and it requires an understanding of the circumstances of the people there, the social demographics around that, social determinants of health. Um, but I'd, I'd like to learn a little bit more about your guys' experience on the global scale and what you've seen outside of the US that could potentially be brought here and adopted to improve patient experience using technology. Well, I'll take a first shot at that. I just, uh, I got the opportunity this year to get down to Chile. And Chile's suffering with a countrywide problem that their healthcare system doesn't keep up. It's not adequate for the population they have. And they run a lot of facilities throughout the country, and it's a very vastly different country. If you get down to Patagonia, that's very different than being in Santiago. And so one of the things that they chose to do is they chose to avoid the fixing of their healthcare system. What they're doing is they're creating what they call the digital hospital capability. So they're creating a whole new experience for healthcare, and they're basically slowly transitioning their patients into that experience. So they keep funding the vehicles they have, but they're slowly taking the capacity away from those stationary vehicles and putting them into this digital care model. And they're doing some very, very creative things. Um, we've got a technology named the HoloLens that they've actually put on people in rural regions to connect them back to people in central regions to help them with care. They've even airlifted those into a couple places through, through um, using drones whenever they had a problem in that area and they needed to solve issues. So they're really looking at how can technology, how can we build a whole new system in technology and then slowly migrate our population to that? It's one of the experiences that I've witnessed in. Well, not to beat the drum, but we have our partnership with our Dutch company because I'm more in the, in, you know, the, uh, again, you mentioned at the top of this, Alan, you know, powerful companies. Well, our company isn't nearly as powerful as AT&T and Citrix and Microsoft. Okay, but uh, so we're sort of at ground level, you know, working day to day with the provider organizations looking to do these things. So we're, we're obviously seeking technology could be deployed here and now today. 
And so we were able to find a, literally a better mousetrap with respect to indoor navigation that's been used in v and train stations, it's been used in museums and art galleries and malls and airports. And we're trying to put the sort of focus around it here, leveraging it in a healthcare context. Because frankly, getting around American hospitals, probably like anywhere in the world, is a very big challenge. I don't know that I have any other examples other than that. So I'll lean on my friends here. I wouldn't say, say examples, but what, what, what we're seeing a trend of more and more is healthcare becoming digital, whether it's you know, Apple getting involved in it so you can download your, your medical history internally or uh, patient portals. I think as we move forward, the identity of a person will be carried along with them with their digital identity. So it, if I go from here to Chile or to, to Norway, I'm always my personal carrier of my record and, and everything that goes with that. So I think as we start moving forward, we'll see more and more adoption to having that record. Maybe maybe it is blockchain. Maybe it's some interoperability with our ethics and CERNers to be able to make that more portable. But as we go through, I see our our personal identity and our digital identity kind of melding into one and becoming, you know, our digital passport for health. And um, a couple of last ways to maybe look at this a little bit differently is um, also within our, our healthcare group at at and we deal with providers and payers and also medical device manufacturers. So from an international point of view, there's a lot of, that we do from a manufacturing and, and making sure that, that some of the supply chain things, lessons that we've learned through cross industry types of work, uh, work specifically like cold chain and some of the things that you have to get into when you're sending tissue samples from the states over to Europe those kinds of things. You need to track it for custody, but you also need, be, need to be able to track some of those things from an environmental point of view. Has the, the cooler been opened or uh, is that, has it been at the right temperature the whole time? So we do see a lot of that when it comes to going around the globe. And just to add another perspective, the global medical tourism industry has continued to rise. Uh, people are flying in from all over the world to places like the Cleveland Clinic or the Mayo Clinic to get healthcare. But a lot of people are also flying to Singapore or to South Korea or to other countries that offer unique and specialized services that are starting to become more and more tech enabled, meaning that they understand who the patient is, they understand their needs, either maybe from a retail perspective. I'll cite an example where a, a patient lands in a country and they're here to see a renowned surgeon. But the health system knows that this patient has a predilection for certain luxury goods. So they plan a trip for them and they take them to these spots and give them the experiences that they're looking for, send them to a spa because they know they like massages, see their surgeon, have their surgery and go home. And it's just a very different, unique experience to think about healthcare as not just being there to get care and then leave or getting a medicine or getting a surgery, but to think about what else you can do to make it a consumer focused experience. So I've seen examples of that around the world and you know, as some of them start to percolate here in the United States, it'll be interesting to see if it gets adopted. Um, so, so we've heard again, great perspectives from all of you, not from your backgrounds and experiences as well as your work. Um, there's providers in the audience and entrepreneurs where are the gaps still, and, and what can folks working in industry, working in IT or data science or you know, delivering frontline care, where are there opportunities that you guys see as potential things that still need a lot of focus on that your company doesn't do? Some companies are just plain out not looking into those areas because they may not be as financially viable or, or attractive in terms of the tech or modernism. But, what is it certain things that other people who are in other industries and different roles can think about as they go back to their the day to day taking care of patients? What are opportunities you think still need a lot of improvement? Well, one of the things that we've noticed through dealing with lots of different industries is that uh, some other industries have moved to a more omni channel type of customer connectivity. Um, right now, we, we see a lot of healthcare providers that have a very important and critical voice need, and in some cases, some of these old hospitals are running on very old PBX systems that are in the basement, and they're praying that they don't lose power because it may not come back up, right? Uh, and now, there's, there's a way to not migrate that to maybe something like hosted voice or, or change your, your system on, on your premises to, to some other architecture. Um, but we've seen a bit of a delay that we haven't seen in other industries. And so the, the sort of the good news is um, now there's, there's a chance to take a step back and take a look at not just replatforming 
removing something that's end of life and replacing it with something that's that's more modern, uh, but also make sure that the business requirements have probably changed in the past 25 to 30 years. Make sure that whatever goes in now meets whatever those new business requirements are. You may not need voicemail. You might want to ask your users how much they've been enjoying their on-prem voicemail system for the last five years, and they'll tell you that they just keep it full and that red light just keeps going. <laughs> Uh, or they, they forward their phone to their cell phone, or th those kinds of things. We all sort of know this, but then again, we all then go back to our desk and decide what it's going to take to replatform and just replace the old stuff with the new stuff. So this is a great opportunity, using that as an example, to again, make sure you go out and you find what the new business requirements are, and uh, in some cases, that requires even omni-channel type of interactivity in some of your contact center um, applications that you may be running. Okay. Um, so I'll add two things that I see that are very, very interesting. So first and foremost, what we've learned from other consumerized businesses, and, and let's not kid each other, we're starting to get consumerized in healthcare. The consumers are coming and driving their demands on us, is that the best organizations in those consumer-oriented companies actually train the consumer how to engage with their organization better than anybody else trains their uh, the, trains them to engage with somebody else. So one of the things you need to be focusing on is the experience that you can train them into, how to work with your organization. A great example is if you go into a children's hospital, how do they navigate? Like as a team of parents and stuff, how do they navigate? How do they know how to use your facilities? If you can train them to do that as a consumer, that's first and foremost. And then the second thing that we see a lot of is there's a drive to push everything as much as possible to home-based care or outside the health system, if you would. So if there's anyone that's in here that's an entrepreneur that's going to generate a device that can go home and help in that care model, that's hugely important. One of the things that we find interesting is we're starting to see a whole bunch of these home-based dialysis, as an example, machines come up where basically we're, we're controlling them over capabilities that are being brought to us by the networks and and we're actually getting better experiences for those patients because they can do it at home over the evening for eight hours. And anything we can package up as a care system and push outward to the point that it, it's needed, that's huge in the entrepreneur space. So if you're looking for something to work on, those types of things. The one thing I'd like to add is that I think one of the challenges we always have in healthcare is that we're very reactive and we, we're always quick to say that that works great in retail, but it won't work in, in, in healthcare. I think we've got to change that mindset and start looking at other verticals that, you know, whether it's you know security from the finance side or customer service from the retail side, and figure out ways that we can incorporate different aspects of those business models into into ours to make the employee experience better as well as the patient experience. It's 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 too long. I've heard that. Well, I know cloud is great, but that that will never work in healthcare. And now we're seeing a lot of these SaaS based applications move there and, and healthcare adopt them. It's it's easy to say that. I think it's a little bit. It would be much more beneficial for organizations to not make those predisposed, you know, consideration before actually looking into it and looking at other verticals that may be doing something similar or leveraging technology that you may not want to look at now because it's too cutting edge. And we're, again, I'm not saying that you should uplift everything and throw it in the cloud. That's just not the, what I'm saying, but there are plenty of positions within your organizations that can adopt some of those newer technologies that may not be patient direct, but everything is important in the patient aspect, whether it's, you know, billing or, or or uh, scheduling or whatever it may be, but there's so many technologies out there that can help your organizations that may not fall directly into, you know, we've done this for years and we feel comfortable with it. I'll look at a different angle on this and I'll suggest that the gap is going to be in security and privacy. We see our European friends moving toward tighter security or tighter privacy, tighter requirements to, to, to opt in to the use of your own data. And I think that our country could very well go that way, depending upon administration, I suspect. Um, but I will suggest that with the explosion of, of, of consumerization, and I think we're on the verge of an explosion of that, and I agree with you, that it's, it's coming, it's here. Um, what you find yourself with now is every patient, every person who's got a health record, who's got information that's considered PHI, is out there with it available right there on their smartphone, probably a lot of it drawn from the cloud. You'd notice that Apple's approach to this is completely the opposite. It never leaves the phone. They've made a very strong stance on that, and that's how they're doing security. 
But with that explosion now, you've got multiple vendors supporting your initiatives to consumerize. Um, and each of those vendors might have their own user stores of uh, credentials and access to PHI. How do we make sure we stay secure and private in that world? That's going to be a big challenge coming. And I don't see, there's not a lot of work being done on that right now. 